you're a regular attender at our midweek service, our midweek prayer meeting, you'll know we're in the book of Jude. So grab a Bible, turn with me to Jude. It has only one chapter, so it goes without saying, Jude chapter 1. And our focus this evening will be to spend the predominant uh, amount of our time in verse 10. Jude chapter 1, verse 10. What I'm going to do, however, is start reading at verse 1, read up until verse 10, and then we'll, uh, we'll lift off with our exposition there. I'm doing that predominantly so that those that have sort of joined in uh, and are not that regular at our midweek prayer meetings, and maybe you haven't been able to just to keep up to date with uh, these particular messages being uploaded to YouTube, you'll find them under the subheading uh, Jude, I think it's called, Earnestly Contend, or something, something like that. I don't exactly remember the wording. Uh, but if you haven't kept up, I think a great way to just kind of overview what we've covered already is to read from verse 10 all the way to uh, verse 1, all the way to verse 10, and then we'll pick up our exposition there as we read God's word together from verse 1. After we read it, we'll pray and dive in. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Verse 6, And angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people, also relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. And here's our focus text for this evening, verse 10. But these people... Blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Let's go together to the Lord to ask His blessing upon His word this evening. Father, we thank You for the richness, the, the true treasure that is Your word, Lord God. We've walked verse by verse through, through everything that we've just read, Lord God, and our hearts have been stirred and challenged and encouraged and I truly believe we've been changed, Lord God, through the ministry of your Spirit, empowering, dwelling, and using these very words, Father, your words. We know they're inspired. We know they are inerrant. They are infallible. They can never fail to do that which you send them forth to do. Father, may your word go forth tonight and bring about the change in our life that we seek according to your grace and all tending to your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I might read that verse 10 again because we really are going to focus fairly, fairly deeply in on that tonight and then we'll jump to our exposition. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. These people, when Jude uses that phrase, he's referring to the malcontents that we have We've come to affectionately call them. We, we, get that, we get that description from the book of Jude. They're called grumblers. They're called lascivious. They're called malcontents. This is how Jude describes them. They are respecters of nothing. But they are slaves. And they have a slavish determination to fulfill their passions and their lusts. If distorting the truth means that they get more satisfaction for their lusts of their flesh than distorting the truth is precisely what they are bent on doing. 
So there's two actions here. Firstly, they blaspheme all that they do not understand. And then there's a passive action. They are destroyed like unreasoning animals by all that they instinctively do understand. They blaspheme what they don't understand. These apostates, these malcontents. Initially, the context suggests that this is still speaking about angels and the standing of angels, the role of angels, the activity of angels, and the warfare of angels. If you joined us last week, you know we spent quite a considerable amount of time analyzing the instance of when the archangel Michael and Satan himself had their dispute over the body of Moses, and the result of that particular dispute was not the archangel Michael bringing a blasphemous or slanderous accusation against Satan, but in fact it was Michael saying, the Lord rebuke you. We're, we're to read verse 9 and conclude that that was the end of the matter. That, that settled the dispute and ended the debate, and the archangel Michael certainly came away on that particular occasion with the victory. But what we read in this is, as we see Jude says that these, these apostates, they blaspheme all that they do not understand. You know, we spent quite a bit of time again last week talking about how it, th there's always this symptom of, of false and quasi-Christianity to be enamored unhealthily with angels. There's always this bad way to relate to or, or speak of or, or not understand, and it always tends toward blasphemy, either blaspheming of angels themselves or blaspheming of God by making too much of angels, worshiping, deifying, and venerating them. So don't be ignorant of angels. Don't be ignorant of angels. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10, Paul wrote this to the Corinthian church. This is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Now the wording here is indicative that it's as though Paul and the Corinthian church understood that very vague phrase. We read that and we scratch our heads. If we don't scratch our heads, we're probably not paying a lot of attention. How on earth is there this relationship between wives having a symbol of authority on their heads got anything to do with the angels? Now, we're not going to dive into that tonight. In fact, we've taught on this before. We have a whole sermon series on the subject of angels at our YouTube channel. Go and look it up. Watch them learn and understand because they're all prone to be just like these malcontents, blaspheme, mistreat, over-venerate or utterly ignore the ministry of angels. Now Paul says, Paul says that, that the wives in the church should have a symbol of authority because of the angels. There's this assumption that Paul has that the Corinthian church and himself have a mutual agreement. That's, there's like a previous discussion that's being referred to and he, and, and, and he goes ahead and makes this allusion as though they're going to follow and they're going to understand. Now we've lost exactly that previous discussion and whenever we hear about angels, it's almost always, when we think about, just for a moment, think about, think about pop culture, or, or, or think about the, the pervading forms of even pop Christianity, if you will. Think about them, and, and think about the way in which they speak about and deal with angels. It's almost always flights of fancy. It's almost always the unstable, governed by their imagination of dreams, not the text of Scripture. In fact, there seems to be, and again, I'll refer to some of the comments I made in that angel sermon series that we taught maybe a little over a year ago here at Oak Grove. I'll refer to that when I, when I said that it seems to be a pretty clear dividing line between the types of Christianity which for the most part are, are off the reservation when it comes to being grounded on Scripture and they're overly enamored by angels and what we normally consider to be biblical Christianity, conservative, Jesus-exalting Christianity, there's almost like an embarrassment. Like we don't, we don't want to be mistaken for for those other Christians, you know the ones, the kind of Christians that are, that are lying on the graves of dead, dead saints trying to suck anointing and, and always trying to pray to and venerate and, and sing worship to angels. That is entirely unbiblical and it's blasphemous. But, but we should learn this lesson well. That just because this whole subject of angeology, that's a real word, I know it sounds made up, this whole subject of angeology is so often commandeered by the spurious and the fantastic and the, well, biblically unsophisticated, does not mean that we have a right to be ignorant. We don't. Scripture speaks constantly and in detail about the ministry, the duty, the service, the warfare of these glorious beings. Now when Jude says 
that these grumblers and these cancerous truth betrayers blaspheme all that they do not understand. We ought not to think that this relates to angels exclusively. It does, in the first instance, speak about angels. But of course, it goes much further than that. These apostates, these malcontents that Jude is encouraging all Christians everywhere, no exception, to be earnestly contending for the truth, we ought to realize that there's a clear delineation now between apostate Christianity, which blasphemes all that it does not understand, and there's a Christianity that is governed by the word and glorifying of Christ. Blasphemy is actually the mother tongue of these apostates. Nothing is sacred. Everything is the butt of the joke to them. There's no reverence in them. They're controlled and mastered by nothing than their selfish egotism. That's how it is. They're driven by an unrelenting desire to please themselves. Now I can understand that this may paint a picture. This may paint a picture of someone utterly without self-control, someone without any social refinement. But we know that these particular apostates that Jude warns us about are not obvious. You may think that as we read Jude's descriptions and you think, well, such an outlandishly apostate person should be pretty easy to detect. Should be pretty easy to tell them, pretty easy to identify them. But remember that Jude tells us they've crept in the church unnoticed. The CSB has this great way of phrasing it. It says, they've come in by stealth. The NIV has a Another great way of phrasing it, they secretly slipped in among you. So the picture that Jude is painting, just to be clear, is not the picture of David. Remember when David, fleeing Saul, went the first time to the Philistines? We studied this in 1 Samuel recently. And David went down and he realized his life was now just as much in danger at the hands of his enemies, the Philistines, as it was previously at the hand of Saul. And so he feigns madness. He starts spitting on himself and and mumbling and, and rambling and babbling. That's not what these apostates are. That's the oneness Pentecostals. Now these apostates are a lot more deadly than that because they are masters of disguise. They're very refined. They're silver-tongued, smooth words that flatter and convince. In fact, in Jude chapter 1, verse 16, we didn't read that tonight, but hear these words. These apostates, these dangerous to the very church of Christ, it says this, they boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. How we have hit that drum of late. How we have strummed that chord of late. When someone is flattering you, don't immediately assume on the first hand, well, it's about time someone noticed and made much of me. And on the other hand, don't assume their motives are always very innocent. Flattery, again, is part of the language of the apostate Christianity. They blaspheme, that's their mother tongue, and they flatter, and by stealth, They gain entrance into good and godly Christian community. Now, the second action in the text, the first one was that these malcontents, they blaspheme everything that they don't understand. And the second thing, Jude says, they are destroyed by their uncritical passion to follow their instinct. They're destroyed by it. I began thinking about this because Jude actually talks about the animal instincts like unreasoning animals. And it created a bit of a word picture in my mind. This idea that these these apostates, these these malcontents, these cancerous pseudo-Christians that are in the church by stealth and are seeking to bring great ruin therein, they're governed, mastered, they're, they're dominated by animal instincts. I began to wonder, what examples are there of unreasoning animals pursuing instinct to their self-destruction. Now, I, I have this advantage. I'll confess it freely. I have this advantage that I live with a biologist. So I turned to my wife and I said, give me some examples of animals, of, of, of animals, regardless of where they're from, that pursue their instincts to their own destruction. Well, well, she began, I must have been a two-hour lecture that I had to sit through. I said, I just want three. I just want three. Give me three. So here they are. Listen to this carefully. This is not made up. This is truly science. 
the antichinus is a small Australian marsupial. Yes, we started there on purpose. It resembles a mouse. Now, the male lives for 11 and a half months, after which they go into a mating frenzy. During this three-week mating season, they aggressively inseminate as many females as they possibly can, one after the next, with each encounter lasting 12 hours. wrestling with whether I should make a joke about geriatric erectile medication or just leave it, just leave it. Late night television. 12 hours. Then they die within the next two weeks of stress-induced immune system breakdown. They suffer internal bleeding, gangrene, and other infections, and it overwhelms them. In three weeks of the, the craziest spring break you can imagine, and then they die. Another example, the female praying mantis often eat their mates during the mating process. Often just feasts on his head. That's a high price to pay. Theme music. The Mexican fighting fish. Actually, I apologize. The Siamese fighting fish are highly territorial. Makes them prone to attacking each other. If housed in the one tank or the one enclosure, they will attack each other until one or both of them die. They're just, they're just that wired, that programmed to, to fight. The much smaller anglerfish fuses, male fuses onto the female's body, sharing her circulatory system. He essentially becomes part of her own permanent set of gonads. Who wrote this? My own dear wife. This is, this is science. And Jude is making this point. Now I know you think, well, we kind of started out sermon and exposition and we're in scripture and then it got weird. Yeah, Jude wants it to get weird. Jude wants you to think about how in the animal world, animals will pursue what they are pre-programmed to pursue, these instincts, even if it means it utterly destroys them. It doesn't matter. They've served their purpose to mate or to fight or to be territorial or whatever it is. And Jude says, that's, that's the description of these apostates. That's what they are. On the one hand, they blaspheme everything that they don't naturally understand. And on the other hand, like unreasoning animals, they actually become destroyed by those things they understand instinctively. They drive themselves to, 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 to self-destruction. Jude is making a very compelling point. Unreasoning Instinct-driven animals act like this. No true Christian acts like this. But we are not, and we can tell in this, we are not unreasoning animals. When humans act like that, they bring destruction on themselves. Rather, we're actually called to reason. Philippians chapter 4 verse 5 says this, Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. And I felt at this point that a comment should be made because I have certainly experienced this, at least in the, in the couple of decades that I've been in, in, in a Bible teaching ministry. I've understood that there have been certain cultures and Christian traditions that are skeptical of reason. I'm sure you can think of them yourself. Well, for us, it's just about faith. And faith means that you don't understand, and faith further means, in addition, you can't understand, and so don't even try. In fact, in fact one of the, the great catchwords of these forms of Christian tradition will say, knowledge puffs up. I remember in my early years, I was actually, I belonged to one of these particular church traditions, and I was pursuing further education to be a better, a better exegete of Scripture, a better Bible teacher. And some well-meaning Christian said, you don't want to do that. You don't want to go to seminary or Bible college or, or read a lot of books. It'll stifle your faith and you'll become too reasonable. So let me say it. Let me go on record as saying it. Don't ever be sympathetic to a version of Christianity that is skeptical of reason. Don't ever be sympathetic toward it. Of course, it needs to be said, here's the caveat. If someone elevates reason to the place of divine authority, divine authority, 
that's not only self-conceited heresy, but it's also the abandonment of reason. It's unreasonable to take reason, human reason, and elevate it to the place of God's Word and divine revelation. Only God's Word is God's Word. This is the rationalist, this is the humanist fatal flaw. Is there assumption that you can take reason and elevate it to the highest supreme place of authority, thus, I would argue, abandoning reason and also undermining the authority of the Word of God? It's not the use of reason that makes an atheist. No, 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 no. It's the worship of reason that makes an atheist. Which itself, I'll restate it again, is utterly unreasonable. Human reason, that is, human reason, in full subjection to the eternal word of God, is true enlightenment. I'm going to read it again because I need this point to come home as hard as it must. Human reason in the full subjection to the Word of God, is true enlightenment. To this we have been called. We've been called not to be the apostates. No, we've been called in Jude to earnestly contend against the apostates who have abandoned reason, who've been mastered by the lusts and the passions of their flesh, and have failed to understand the role of God's Word in their life and the power to think clearly to gain mastery over the lusts and passions of our baser self, to resist the instinct of our nature, to resist the instinct of reckless abandonment in the pursuit of pleasure, that is always death. That is the way of the animal kingdom, not the way of the church of Jesus Christ. We're not skeptical of reason, but we do demand that reason is always in subjection to the word of God and always always used wisely. Let's go back to this verse and think of our concluding thoughts. But these people, Jude says, they blaspheme all that they do not understand and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. This is the call of God, that we would resist them, firm in the flesh, firm in the faith rather, Resist them and continually fight the temptation of the flesh. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? We're going to look and pray God's blessing upon this study together this evening. Father, we thank you for this opportunity tonight to gather as Christ's people, as the church. We thank you for this particular epistle that Jude wrote in the first century to churches. And of course, in turn, it becomes your word to us. Father, we thank you that your word is clear, calling us to understand, to be reasonable, to search the scriptures, to to see if these things be so, and to know you, Lord God, as you have revealed yourself in Christ through the gospel. I pray, Lord God, that we would take this warning to heart tonight, not to be skeptical of reason, but to be skeptical of flatterers, that that, that we would learn this well, Lord God, how how to earnestly contend in a spirit-filled, scripture-guided manner, that we wouldn't, we wouldn't be people like the Siamese fish that just fights till its own death for the sake of conflict, or like those, those other animals that we spoke of, Lord God, that you designed to be this way, to be, uh, t- to be so governed by their instinct to mate and reproduce, they destroy themselves. You've not called us to be that. In fact, Lord God, you've not called any human to act like that. But Lord, we need to take this word to heart tonight. What areas of our life, Lord God, can your spirit shine the light of conviction on us where we have given over in reckless abandon to the satisfaction of the lust of our flesh? Father, how have we failed where we ought to have stood firm in the faith against malcontents and grumblers and and divisive people in our own lives, in our own faith communities? Help us to take Jude's word deeply to heart, Lord God, and help us to live out the implications of this. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.